being in polyamory communities, you know how hard emotional literacy is, is, is prioritized, how much autonomy and communication is prioritized. So like knowing that I'm able to sort of model my, you know, model my communication skills, model like my emotional literacy after that, because that's, you know, of, of all of these overlapping communities, that's the one that gets communication best. Kink is the one that gets, um, that gets um, consent best. Swinging might be the one that gets hedonism best. And it's like, all right, well, I would like to be hedonistic. I would like to be communicative. I would like to have my consent on point. So it's like, if I'm taken from the best of these places, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be the best at these things for the benefit of like myself and my community, the people that I'm with. Like, I don't want to hurt anybody. So like, let me get, let me, let me take it from the place that that's doing it, that's doing it right from the place that's doing it best. Welcome to the Give and Consent podcast. The goal of this show is to introduce you to the people and ideas behind sex positivity. And today I'm joined by Kevin Patterson. Thanks for being with me, Kevin. Hey, it's, it's appreciated. It's appreciated. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Um, I wanted to have you on the show because you wrote a book that's become very popular um, within a lot of different groups, not just in sex positivity, but also if you know a lot in the kink scene uh, more than anywhere else. Um, called Love's Not Colorblind. And then you also have a brand called Poly Role Models. And I think I'd like to start talking about poly role models. Um, yeah. What does it mean for you like, to be polyamorous and be a role model in that community? Um, so there's always this sort of misconception that that's about like sort of like perfect polyamory and so on. Um, the, 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 the goal of the, the blog, and granted, it's, it's not... Um, the blog uh, Poly Role Models was an interview series, and it's not active anymore. But like, it's still it's not a, it's not active, but it is still available. The goal was basically to have representation for polyamory that looked the way polyamory actually looks, and not just sort of the the whitewashed, homogenous uh, viewpoint of uh, of polyamory that you get from from monogamous people who are looking for a, like a sensationalist concept. Um, so the idea was to show it the way that, that it actually looks. And then also it was to show people with flaws. And I wanted to make sure that I showed people like one of the questions in the, in the blog was like, what, you know, what is this, what, what kind of stuff do you struggle with and how do you address the things that you struggle with? So like, you know, if some, you know, there are polyamorous people who are also super jealous or who have like, you know, poor communication skills or emotional literacy, or they're just like, so they're so hardwired with, um, you know, with monogamous socialization that just being polyamorous is, uh, is a struggle for them. And like, I wanted to make sure that I showed people with flaws who are still, you know, active and successful in their polyamory. Cause we get so little, uh, we have such, you know, we don't have much of a roadmap when it comes to polyamory. We, we, we don't have modeling. We don't have pop culture. We don't always have a bunch of role models. So it's easy to make, you know, one mistake and think maybe this thing isn't for me or to have one relationship go wrong and, and, and just, you know, go back to a culture that, that, that warmly embraces you as monogamous, even though, you know, monogamous people screw up their relationships all the time and almost never say, well, maybe it's the monogamy that's the problem. You know, polyamorous folks do that all the time. Yeah. What, what do you think is key to having like a successful polyamorous relationship and not bring in that toxicity you were talking about? Uh, communication. Communication, integrity, and emotional literacy. Like I've, like, I've made... Like, I've made more polyamorous mistakes than I than I than I'd like, you know. And almost all of them were tied to communication and integrity, you know. Almost all of them were, you know. I I I I, I was dishonest in a way that I shouldn't have been. Dishonest in a way that I didn't need to be, you know. Uh, and if you know, it often blew up in my face in one way or another. And every time that I favored integrity over over bullshit. I've had a better time with my non-monogamy. And every time that I've stopped and been like more communicative, um, you know, every, more, every time that I've used my words instead of, you know, just being, you know, sitting around being upset, it's been a better time for me. You know, like my mistakes, thankfully my biggest mistakes are years in the past, but they've happened and like, and they still hurt, you know? And I still have to remember them when I go into a new situation where I'm given an opportunity to be, you know, dishonest, when I'm giving a, a, an opportunity to be stompy instead of communicative, you know, like 
just just understanding those things about myself and how well it's worked out when I've prioritized integrity and communication, you know, that's that's been that's been sort of the key to my polyamory. That's really wonderful. And I think that comes up a lot, the idea of learning to be better communicator and so really like the, the integrity you mentioned, like knowing yourself, because sometimes we we try to people please or whatever, like we're not doing it on purpose. Um, yeah. I love that. Uh, how long have you been in the poly community and how did you end up here? Um, like in, communi- in community, um, maybe five or six years, five, oh, like somewhere, somewhere like between five and 10 years. But I've been actively non-monogamous for like uh, 19 years. Like I'm going into like my 20th year of, of, uh, of active non-monogamy. Um, the... Basically, the, the 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 short version of the story is uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I we went on a trip with some friends. I made a joke about how it was going to be, you know, sexually active young people partying and drinking. Something wild might happen, you know. Just kind of just trying to get a rise out of my my new girlfriend, and it ended up happening. You know, some wild things happened on that trip that we ended up uh, bringing home with us, and what I expected was this is going to ruin my relationship. You know, any, 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 any um, spur of the moment brush with non-monogamy is going to ruin this relationship. Sure. I'll have a fun story to tell my homeboys, but you know, but this, this great, this great woman that I'm dating, we're going to break up as a result of this. And instead it didn't break us up. It just started some great conversations about what we wanted out of our relationship, what we wanted out of our lives. And it turned out that exclusivity just wasn't as important to us as we would have guessed it would have been at the start of this relationship. Like we were only like six months into dating when all of a sudden exclusivity went out the door and we didn't know what we were doing for the first several years of it. Um, so that's why I say like we were been non-monogamous for 19 years and in the community for less than 10 because like we didn't even know there was a community it was just us flying by the seat of our pants for for like a decade before we finally found ourselves like surrounded by people that we could have um you know culturally relevant conversations with yeah i i completely understand that like i went through a similar thing of discovering the non-monogamy piece and then discovering community would you define like polyamory as being part of that community like what's the difference between non-monogamy and poly um, the non-monogamy can be can, can be anything that's just not monogamous. Like that non-monogamy is just sort of this umbrella term where when we started out, we didn't really know what we were doing. Polyamory being more relationship focused, being more love focused. Um, eventually, after sort of like bouncing around and dating whoever would have us, we realized like this isn't enough. We want something a little bit more sustained. We want something a little bit more committed you know we want to be able to make agreements and set you know and and have futures with the people that we're with not just you know fooling around whenever we get a chance uh and that's sort of when it went from you know this overarching umbrella of non-monogamy to like we are actively doing polyamory nice nice and um i I know this because i've I've read your book and you kind of just hinted at it there I, I feel like when it comes to different sex positive communities, like there, there's like the kink scene, there's the swinger scene, there's the poly scene, there's the nudist scene, and you're part of a lot of those different groups or you've been part of them. Like what, what kind of observations or knowledge have you gained from being among those different communities? Um, it's, sort of a, it's sort of an interesting thing because like each of those things sort of prioritizes a thing. And like, just sort of the overlap allows you to sort of make sure your priority. Like, so, um, the like the the kink the kink scene has its own version of consent that's really high level. Whereas, like, if I go to a if I go to a swinger party, I've noticed that people's version of consent at like a swinger establishment is not the same. You know, like there's 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 there is um, sometimes some non-consensual touching non-consensual looking and you know things things that shouldn't fly in any establishment can, would fly in a swinging event whereas in a kink event that might get you tossed out so like knowing that it's like okay well let me model my consent a little bit more after kink you know or like um being being in polyamory communities you know how hard emotional literacy is 
is is prioritized how much autonomy and communication is prioritized so like knowing that i'm able to sort of model my you know model my communication skills model like my emotional literacy after that because that's you know of, of all of these overlapping communities that's the one that gets communication best kink is the one that gets um that gets um consent best swinging might be the one that gets hedonism best and it's like all right well I would like to be hedonistic. I would like to be communicative. I would like to have my consent on point. So it's like if I'm taken from the best of these places, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to be the best at these things for the benefit of like myself and my community, the people that I'm with. Like I don't want to hurt anybody. So like let me get let me let me take it from the place that that's doing it that's doing it right from the place that's doing it best. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for that that overview because I think. We can judge people who are in different communities than ours. And I love that you're just like, no, oh, these have different focuses. That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, and, and don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not like, a, like, I'm, I am not a fan of swinger consent, you know, um, because I see a lot of stuff get a free pass that, that, that really shouldn't, but like, I'm not going to throw away, I'm not going to throw away the whole of a swing scene because you know, like that's going to be something where I'm going to try to work around that. I'm going to try to bring my best to it. And hopefully that'll help, you know, um, and then I'll take the best from it and try to give my best back to it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, totally. Um, speaking of contributing to the community, you wrote a book and I want to talk about it um, called Love's Not Colorblind. I actually um, am in a book club and we're reading this right now um, in five pieces. Yeah. But it's it spurred a lot of really interesting discussion because what you're pointing out is the issues around um, not just race, but um, like fetishization and things that happen to queer folks. And I just, I'm curious what inspired you to write that and um, like what, what results have you seen from it? Because I know that you've, you've been out in the community for a while, the book's been out for a while. So let's start with why'd you write it? Um, I always talk about like, like that, like the key to all of my work is it's just me talking about myself. Um, like I, I, I'm in the Philadelphia. I'm, I live in the Philadelphia area, and for the first couple of years that I was in like the the polyamory community, I felt like I was the token black guy. And I would talk about that all the time. I talk about it with my friends, my partners, you know, in and out of polyamory communities. And at some point, someone was like, "Hey, Kev, you should be talking about this in educational spaces because this is something people would want to hear." And so I started talking about it in, in educational space and people really did want to hear it. Like all of a sudden, you know, I was filling up rooms and people were like, like having conversations. I was getting asked to like, you know, be quoted in articles and things, which was all of it was like really unexpected because I expected like I'd go to sex ed conferences and find myself being the only person talking about polyamory, which was unexpected. And I'd find myself in polyamory conferences and be the, and find myself as the only person talking about race. So um, I actually approached uh, Thorn Tree Press, the publishers of Love's Not Colorblind, with another idea, something stemming from um, uh, the, the blog, Poly Role Models. And they were like, well, that sounds like a good enough idea, Kev, but like we've been hearing about this race and polyamory workshop. Would you be interested in writing a book about that instead? So I basically just took the, the talking points of the... Uh, talking points of the workshops that I had already been doing and expanded it into a book. And like, I jokingly say that the reason why Love's Not Colorblind is a good book is because I say the same thing like four times in a row in every chapter where it's like, here's an explanation. Here's, a, you know, here's somebody else telling a story about fetishization. And here's a definition of fetishization. And here's an analogy about fetishization. And, you know, just over and over and over and over and over. Um, and, uh, like, you know, here's some academic research about, you know, about the topic. And so just doing that, it sort of allows people to, to hear the same thing multiple times from above. So if you're somebody who's into like academic research, you're going to get some of that. If you're into something, you know, if you're someone like me who's way into analogies, you're going to get something like that. If you're into like, you know, like rope, uh, rope definitions, if you're in, you know, anecdotal, anecdotal evidence, you're going to get all of those things in like, really short and concise chapters i didn't realize how short and concise they were the people started pointing that out to me but that's fine um the results that i've seen though is like i still get people messaging me from time to time like the book's been out about three years three years in, a, in about 
three weeks from the from the recording of this, it'll be three years since the book released. And I still get people who reach out to me and say, like, hey, I've got a book club. Hey, I, you know, um, I read this book. I gave it to the organizers of my local community and they made some changes around the way they around the way they organize, about the way they set up their uh, their events. So they've changed. You know, we've changed our leadership around some things that we've read in your book. And it's like all of that's really great to hear. And I hope that it helps. I hope that it makes people feel more welcome in one community or another. Um, I I just want to put good in the world. I just want to have, you know, I just want to provide some value and give people sort of the safety that I didn't feel in my first couple of years in the local community. Yeah, I really appreciate reading that about your book, being somebody who runs events and is part of this community, um, be, because I didn't feel like there was anything accusatory about it. It was really about understanding the perspectives of other people. Um, and, and I really appreciated that. And with that in mind, can you tell me, why isn't love colorblind? Isn't it better to be colorblind? Because that's what I was taught when I was younger. Yeah, and like that's that's something a lot of that's something a lot of white folks get taught. Uh, so, uh, the the intention is the intention is good. The intention is tr is treat everybody exactly the same, which on the surface sounds great. Um, the actuality of it, the application of it, is not recognizing systemic imbalances where they are you know where like i grew up in small i grew up in small town usa i'm a jersey boy i grew up in small town uh usa where at the top of any tall building i could see you know the twin towers back before september 11th i could see empire state building in the background i got new york radio stations and in this small town i learned about racism before you know uh, before I was old enough to buy cigarettes, you know, just walking around with a bike meant that cops might jam me up and tell me, hey, is that your bike? You know, me sitting, waiting for the bus, reading a comic book. What are you doing here, kid? Why are you here? What are you doing? My high school uniform was a suit. So I'm a guy in a suit reading a comic book. And all of a sudden, my life is being interrupted by cops. That's my experience as a black man in America. And like, if you look up actual, the actual stats of that small town in, in New Jersey, it gets worse. I got it pretty light compared to, to others. Being colorblind ignores all that shit, you know? Being colorblind is like, oh, sure, that could happen to anybody. It, it could happen to anybody, but it doesn't happen to anybody. Um, a lot of times I find myself in, in these debates, which I'm getting better at avoiding with white folks will say, well, that happened to me too. I'm a white guy. I got messed up by the cops when I was doing blah, blah, blah. And within that blah, blah, blah is like a whole story of why they got fucked up by cops. Whereas my story of getting fucked up by cops was I was waiting for the bus. I was walking with my bike. You know, I was in an area I was perfectly, I was perfectly, um, I was, I was in a place I was supposed to be, I was doing a thing I was supposed to be doing, I was age appropriate, I was not a criminal, I was just minding my business when my life got interrupted. Your life got interrupted because you were being an asshole at some time and place where you shouldn't have been. Our stories are not the same. Yeah, I, and I think you hit the nail on the head with that with, in the book with all of your analogies and stories because they come from lots of different perspectives. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Like something, um, like while I was doing the workshops that led to Love's Not Colorblind, like something that became really, really apparent to me because like I said, I, I talk about my, I'm talking about myself so often that I worry that I'm old, that my perspective is individual and I'll be telling a story in a workshop saying like, Hey, I got fetishized in this way. And I'll see like a couple of black folks in the, you know, in various parts of the room all nodding their head, you know, or sometimes I'll point someone out and they'll tell a story of how, you know, a similar thing happened to them, like what happened to me. So when I wrote Love's Not Colorblind, I was like, I could write a story from my own perspective on all of these topics because they all apply. Or I could reach out to this person and that person and this person and that person and have them all tell their stories. Their stories aren't that different from mine, you know? But I wanted to make sure that people understood this isn't just about me. It's a widespread thing. These are systemic issues. These aren't just individual things. Yeah. 
you also, you mentioned earlier, you, you repeat things a lot. A thing that gets repeated in the book a lot that resonates with me as an organizer is if you're not being intentionally inclusive, you're being unintentionally, ex oh, I'm saying it wrong now, exclusive. Basically, you're, you're, unless you're doing it on purpose, you're excluding people. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I wrote that and that, that seems to be the quote that everybody got and, and ran with. And I'm glad I didn't realize I was writing. I, I didn't realize I was writing a bit of magic there until people told me it was magic. But it's, it's true because a lot of people say, well, our community is not like that. We don't exclude anybody. Well, un unless you're actively pushing for people to come in, unless you're actively making an effort to get people in there, the magic doesn't just happen on its own. You can't just hang out a welcome sign and expect everyone to show up. Like if you're having your if you're having an event and it's all white people all the time and you're in an area that isn't just all white people all the time, there's something else happening that's giving you the audience that you're getting, you know, whether that's a matter of uh, uh, location or class, you know, like if your event has, um, has a cover charge, if it's in an area of town where people of color, where black folks aren't, you know, there's something happening here that's giving you an all white population that your welcome sign isn't overriding. So you have to be active about it. You have to be proactive about it. Completely. Um, at our events, we always make sure to ask people to say what pronouns they use. And I always have to explain because we're not used to doing that in most circles. Because yeah. if I tell you my pronouns, then you don't make assumptions about me. And you give a lot of ideas in the book about how to do the same thing around race. Because for many of us, like I was not raised to think about race. And that's what the purpose of this book is to say, look at it from a different lens. Like, how do, how do we do yeah. that? Um, I mean, you, you have to just make, you have to like put in the effort to make it a part of your conversation. Like, um, like, um, lo locally we put like pronouns, we put pronouns on our, uh, on our, what's it called on our name tags all the time, you know, uh, at my job, which has nothing at all to do like, my, my, my jobby job, my real job, like, uh, which has nothing to do with like, you know, polyamory kink or anything like that. Um, I put my pronouns in my email signature. I put it on my uh, on my name tag and everything like that because I don't know who's gonna see that signature. I don't know who's gonna like who's gonna you know read these emails. So like I'm, it's something I make it a point to do because if that's something that like my trans friends have to think about all the time, I try to make it something that I think about all the time. Where you say like you weren't raised to 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 think about race like. Black folks are racist to think about race as a matter of survival, you know? Like, it's not just, you know, I'm mad about race. Like, I just, like, everything from the classroom to interactions with police officers and, you know, and interactions with, like, you know, teachers and educators and, like, um, um, like you know, church and the clergy. Like, you start picking up really early where the inconsistencies are when... You tell your white friend, hey, this thing happened to me. And they're like, wow, that's fucked up, Kev. And then you tell your black friend the same story. And they're like, yeah, that happened to me. You start picking up on these inconsistencies. And like, by the time you're 15, you're ready to write a sociology paper, you know? Whereas your white peers are just like, wow, that's some strange thing that happened. How do you know it's really about race? And it's like the most frustrating thing possible. So like, you have to make it a part of your you have to make it a part of your daily operation. You have to make it something that you're thinking about. We're in the same way. Where like if I'm out with a with a with a female partner, I've I've got to pay attention to like if I'm going to a store, is this person talking to me when she's the person buying something? Like I've got to note that. Like it's, it's you know if I'm in a meeting and I'm seeing someone getting interrupted, is that something that like am I taking am I taking notice of that? Like, if it's something where I am a person of privilege and by which I'm like, I'm cis, I am male, I am educated, I make a certain amount of money, I'm tall, I'm handsome. Um, if there's a place where I am of privilege, I've got to make it a point to see where I benefit from the oppression of others. And I've got to counteract that where I can. I've got to make that a thought process for me in the same way that it has to be a thought process for someone else's survival. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, in this conversation too, like you said, the thing is we need to, it needs to be on our minds. Like as, as white people, we need to think about the fact that there are things that we don't deal with other people do. And that has to do with the color of their skin. 
And like I said, I was raised to be like, you know, don't bring up race. Like if I was describing it, I'd be like, you know, he's in the gray hoodies, like he's got shaved head, don't be yeah. black. It's so uncomfortable. What do you say to people who are like, well, I'm not going to get it perfect. So just, we won't talk about it. No one's ever going to get it perfect. I mean, like all you have to do is commit yourself to like learning better and doing better. Like no one's ever going to get it perfect and no one needs your, and no one needs your tears. You know what I mean? Like, there are times there are times where I'm gonna screw up somebody's pronouns. There's gonna, you know, there's gonna be time where like the the misogyny under which I was raised, the patriarchy under which I was raised, that's gonna come out of my mouth in some way that I'm gonna regret after I say it. I can either cry about it or I can apologize and try to do better. You know, I can listen to the person who's telling me that the thing that I said uh, hurt them. You know, um, as an uh, as an analogy, uh, there's uh, there's a couple of documentaries. Uh, one of the, like the the heirs of the Johnson and Johnson Empire does like um, makes movies about class issues as someone who was born rich, and like he, something he talks about is how the rich folks, like like mega rich folks, they are taught to never talk about money. Like you don't talk about money, you don't talk about class because like any one of these mega rich folks that can, could have like solved the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, you know, out of their pocket change, but they're taught to not talk about these things, you know, because acknowledging the power structures that keep them in power would deep uh, would depower them. So they're taught to never talk about the thing that benefits them and oppresses others, and that's that's the same as like talking, you know, being raised as trying to be colorblind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, within Sex Positive, what we have is an advisory board where we basically just check in with them and go, how are we doing? And it has opened eyes to things that we, we were getting wrong. Like no one was angry with us. They were really happy that someone was listening um, because you talk about this in your book. Also, the fact that these kinds of issues, because I think mostly because of that socialization is like it falls on deaf ears. So, like, what, what do you see now that is going well? What can we be doing better? Um, I'm, I'm always an advocate of, like, ch like changing, changing leadership. Um, I'm always an advocate of changing leadership. And, like, I, I know that's something that hurts people because no one wants to not be in power anymore, you know? But, like, I'm always saying, like, change up your leadership, change up who you have as leaders because, like, having a differentiation of, uh, of leaders gives you different perspectives, gives you different solutions, gives you solutions to questions you didn't even know to ask, you know? Like, I'm one able-bodied guy. And if I'm having a problem getting, like, uh, people with disabilities at events that I'm running, then it's not, it's not going to be me that's going to come up with the answer. It's going to be people with disabilities. So like, why aren't they part of the organizing? Why aren't they part of the leadership? You know? So like, if this is a problem I have, we've got to get people in who, uh, who we listen to. We have to get people in who we, who have like real, real deciding power. You know, not just figureheads, not just tokens, people who we listen to, people who we believe, people who we trust, people who we, who we, who we let make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what else from your book that I definitely want to talk about? What do you say to people who say to you, I'm not racist? Um, what I will say, someone's like, well, I'm not racist. My first thought is, it's not really your determination to make. You know, like I can go ahead and say I'm not transphobic, but I know that like I'm not always going to get it 100 percent right. And if I get it wrong, even even just once, trans people have the right to feel however the fuck they want to feel about me. If I get it right once or if I get it right, or if I get it wrong once and right 100 times, they still have the right to feel however which way they, they want to feel about me. It's not about me reaching a goal point and saying, I'm not this, I'm not that. It's about me trying to learn and do better. So when someone tells me they're not racist, it's like, all right, well, I don't know what you want, want me to do with that information. Because a lot of times when people tell me I'm not, when people say I'm not racist, it's right after they did some racist shit and they're just trying to assure me that they're one of the good ones. And I'm like, that's not information I can use. Like, if you're not racist, your actions will tell me that. You know, you don't need to notify me. I'm actually more wary of people who tell me straight up, I'm not racist. Yeah, totally. I, I think also there's a great piece to um, like communication and that if someone does call you out that like saying I'm not racist is like it, it's, it's very pushback. Like don't, don't try and correct me. 
So it's yeah. better to listen to the person who's saying, no, what you're saying is a problem. You know what's a really fun exercise? And by fun, I mean really sad and depressing. If you Google the term, I don't have a racist bone in my body, like word for word. If you Google that phrase, the amount of racist shit you will read in one article or the next, this person in Florida did this racist thing, this person in Ohio, this person in New Jersey, this person in here, all over the world, people doing some really heinous shit, some really problematic shit. And then when someone points it out, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Just like quote that and put it in your Google in your Google machine and see what comes up. Like that's everybody wants to be the hero of their own story, and that's you know everyone wants to you know explain themselves in the nicest terms possible. And that's the kind of thing you get up you know you get when you're when you're giving your own description. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's at the core of a lot of this is like this. The, the idea is what we're talking about in, in oppression and racism is these are things that are sprinkled throughout society because of the power structures, because of the social structures. It doesn't have yeah. to do with you personally being a terrible person. And I think that's yeah. a lot of how it lands on people. Yeah, like I, I've got like, I've got enough friends that use the phrase men are trash. And like, there are times where I like, like I'd say like four times out of five, I see men are trash and I'm like, yeah, men are trash. You know, no big deal. I, it, it just rolls off my back. But like every once in a while, I'll read it and it hurts. And then I'll stop and remember like as much as it might have hurt me to read that, it hurts somebody else to have to write that shit. Because the person who wrote that shit wants to trust men, you know? It's not like they, they, want, they don't want to hate men. They want to trust men and have been failed enough times that they're writing men are trash. So like when I read it and I, and I, and I, and I feel it, I have to, uh, you know, I have to remember, like, are they talking about me? Are they talking about something that I've done you know, specifically? No? Cool. Are they talking about something that I have done specifically? Why am I doing that? Is it something that I need to be doing? Is it something that I can learn learn and do better around? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, where can people find you if they want to read more about you or if they want to hear the Poly Role Models uh, interviews? All right, so... Get your pencil. <laughs> um, well, like, Blood's Not Cover Blind is available anywhere books are sold. Um, uh, myself and Dr. Liz Powell also have, um, we, Dr. Uh, myself and Dr. Liz Powell have classes called Unfuck Your Polyamory. We've got Unfuck Your Polyamory for individuals where it's, you know, people who are practicing polyamory. Uh, it's a, it's a six class webinar. It's available on unfuckyourpolyamory.com. And then there's Unfuck Your Polyamory Pro, which is for people who want, um, like service providers, coaches, therapists, uh, people in medical fields, anybody who, who wants to serve polyamorous clients and wants to do better around that because like the, the stigma is real and sometimes it's hard to really communicate with people if they're living a lifestyle that isn't the same that uh, that you are what or what have you both of them are available on unfuckyourpolyamory.com um also i write uh, fiction books uh, myself and alana phelan the polyamorous librarian we have a series of queer polyamorous uh superhero novels called for hire uh, right now, for higher audition and for higher operator, reverse that. Operator is the first one. Audition is the second one. We're working on the, we're actually completing production on um, the third book, um, for higher supercell right now. Um, if you go to um, facebook.com uh, slash for higher mag, for higher mag, that is uh, where you can get all the new news, all the new news about uh about the for hire books um we're getting ready to put out the audio books for for all of them soon and uh we're going to be crowdfunding for the third book supercell uh within i think within the next month so like exciting times in the for hire universe nice wait you said it's a comic book but then you're making an audio version oh it's uh How's that uh, work? they're they're superhero books but they're they're all pros uh like okay, because because we're geeks and because the comic books uh, are, or because the covers are, are drawn, uh, a lot of times it's confused for comic books, but they're all, they're all prose novels and we're just finishing up with the audiobook for the first one and we're getting production started on the second one like this week. Wow, uh, you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 working, working my butt off. Awesome. 
Um, my, my last question for you is, um, so we're, we're in an interesting time because we've been in isolation and separated. And then of course, yeah. everything that happened in 2020 around race and Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, my, my question for you is for those who are watching and listening, how, how do we come back together well in a better way and like, get through this time where, as we're starting to come back together? I honestly don't know. Um, like there, there's like a lot of like universal truths. Um, like in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, if you get if you get bit, you're supposed to tell your survivor camp so that you don't cause another outbreak. We've learned from COVID that there are there's about fifty percent of us who would not do that. I don't know how we have a society full of people who would lie to their survivor camp. You know, like we, you know, like something as simple as wearing a mask, protecting your, you know, protecting the people around you, that that became a hurdle too much for for so many people. I don't know how we bring things back together where, and like it's like we we we're we're coming out of a presidential cycle where everything was called untrue, where where everything was everything's become invalid like there is no there is no there's no news media that we can trust anymore every news media is all agenda if i you know if i say like hey the sky is blue there's 50 percent of, of americans who are going to tell me that i'm wrong if i say water is wet there are 50 percent of americans that are going to tell me that i'm biased i don't know how we get back together at a time where nobody trusts anybody every process is 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 um is seen as invalid i i, I got nothing i've got <laughs> oh my goodness that's that's not a very hopeful note to end on yeah yeah <laughs> but there's always queer queer polyamorous superhero books those are pretty positive <laughs> tell me more about the superhero books <laughs> um yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, myself and Atlanta Phelan, we 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 started we started these books. Um, like, I actually wrote the first one, the first draft of the first one. Like while I was writing Love's Not Colorblind, like I just needed a mental break from all of that, all of that talk about race and racism, and I ended up just writing a a, a whole book about a couple of young women who met and bonded over technology and like carved out their own path to being superhuman by way of technology, and it just turned into its own universe where. Um, what I wrote during that first draft, the second half of that is the first book, Operator. We're working on releasing the first half of it, uh, Supercell. And then the book, Audition, is its, own, is its own isolated story set inside the same universe. Like, there's a little bit of overlap in terms of characters, but it's, um, but it's, it's doing entirely its own thing. It just became something really fun to write, really fun, hopefully, to read. And then also, we wanted to make sure we did something with rep representation, um, like sci-fi representation that we don't usually see. And that like a lot of science fiction universes, they sort of speculate that you're in this world without racism, world without homophobia and so on. But like one, they never explain how you got to that place. And two, the story still follows a cishet white guy. Um, so we wanted to write stories full of people of color, of, full of a uh, story that's set in the real world with less oppression that explains why there's less, you know? Yeah, you're, you're reminding me a little bit of like how Star Trek had introduced new ideas and then you're doing it through uh, superhero stories. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What's what's the main conflict that they're having to, to fight with? Um, in, the, in, the, in the first book, it's sort of a uh, shadow government stuff. Um, it's kind of shadow government stuff, but like, something that I really enjoy about it and like I'm talking about it like I didn't write it but um that there's we do the love triangle thing but we subvert it in a way where these are polyamorous characters you know usually it's you know person a is into persons b and c and who will they choose where we want to make it a point where the conflict wasn't that three people were into each other the conflict is that there are parts of each other's lives that each of them can't share with one another you know the fact that three people are into each other that's just fine, you know? But like, I can't tell you about my superhero life. I can't tell you about my celebrity life. These kind of things are um, different kinds of, uh, different kinds of conflicts that we, that we want to work in there. And then like, you know, there's also, it can also be, you know, kinky and sexy and fun as well. You know, like they're still saving worlds, but also 
fun is had. That sounds like a lot of fun to read. I, I love uh, the, the representation and also just kind of just new ways of looking at this stuff because, uh, you know, we've all seen the Marvel movies and I like other stories for sure. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've watched those movies so many times. I, 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 know, I know them all word for word at this point. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated it and until next time. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. If you want to see more, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that we end up in your feed. If you got something out of this personally that was helpful to you, also please leave a comment below. I love hearing the feedback about what's working and what's not. That's what makes this show better. And until next time, love you more and we'll see you then.